Welcome back. It's Dr. Pauly here, Session 3, International Entrepreneurship, MGT4520. And today, today, we are going to talk about cultures and how it relates to international entrepreneurship. The objectives for today's class include introduce the importance of culture in achieving success as a global entrepreneur, describing how language, whether it be verbal or nonverbal, can influence the message of a product or service, understanding the effect of societal structure and religion on decisions, discussing how economic and political philosophies impact culture, and lastly, emphasize the importance of learning about the manners and customs of different cultures for successful venture launch. What is culture? What is the nature of culture? And culture in Latin, also known as cultura, meaning cult or worship. It's a common way of thinking and behaving passed down by family, social organizations, and reinforced through social pressures. It is a learned behavior that adapts and evolves over time. As you experience more, the nature of culture can shift. And lastly, lastly identity of the individual and society. As you will see in the figure pulled from the textbook, National culture systems, values, norms, traditions, attitudes, laws, and institutions. We draw from things like education, economic philosophy, religion, social structure, how your parents raised you, how your parents' parents raised your parents. It is all connected. It all shapes the nature of culture. Values. What are values? What are morals? What are ethics? And values are your basic beliefs about good and evil, what is right and wrong, what is good and bad. And to put it in perspective, the more entrenched values are in a group, so the more the group believes in those values, the less likely those values are to change. Now, values exist between cultures. We might share common beliefs between cultures. Values and culture can change over time such as the lifetime of employment. And now you need to be aware of cultural dimensions in foreign markets, how to adapt, how to support, and how to promote different values, different cultural beliefs accordingly. From our International Entrepreneurship Textbook, we draw on seven cultural determinants, which are language, social structure, religion, political philosophy, economics and economic policy, education, manners and customs. Language is not just about audio. It's not just about verbal. It also includes nonverbal communication. It also involves how we behave, how we act, how we react in a physical nature. So not only in a verbal nature, but also in a physical nature. Now you must have command of the knowledge you are participating in, in order to understand language. There's local translation, expertise, and local understanding of language customs. And more importantly, or most importantly, when we're looking at language, there are nonverbal cues that we can pick up on to determine whether or not a person is interested, not interested, angry, happy. So we can see that language in its physical form can be connected to physical cues. Table 3.1 from your textbook shows potential translation problems. And we can see for the first instance, Kentucky Fried Chicken in English, the translation is finger licking good. Now in Chinese, however, when you take that language and you translate it into, I'm not sure if they translate it into Mandarin or Cantonese here, but in, in China, the translation finger licking good comes out as eat your fingers off. Now, this is not exactly a great translation. This is not exactly what you want your customers to think about when they're trying to buy a bucket of chicken, okay? And so we can see language can present certain problems for international business. This video here is looking at body language and it's looking at 
you know, how people communicate to each other non-verbally. Now, I know and I recognize that this video, which which I pulled off of YouTube, and you can access it here through this link, I know that this video is talking about, you know, trade craft and it's talking about spies and, and that sort of thing, but I really want you to take in and understand that how we communicate non-verbally gives indicators. And this is incredibly important when it comes to starting a business, when it comes to you know operating businesses globally, when it comes to communicating sales. So I want you to take a quick look at this video and you know just try to digest some of the information that he is discussing regarding body language and the interpretation of body language. All of us have social structures whether it's vertical, whether it's horizontal, whether it's hierarchical, whether it's collective decision making. And social structures, at least in the family context, you have children, parents, grandparents, great grandparents. And as mentioned, it's very hierarchical. So in social stratification, which is categorizing people into rankings based on factors like wealth, income, education, family, background, and power, we often do this when we're looking at you know, target markets, when we're looking at customers, when we're looking at customer demographics and the information that we need that is highly relevant to selling in a new market. So not only in our domestic markets, but possibly looking at selling in the global market, social stratification can be very important to understand the layers of a population. Now, social structures will impact business in some capacity wherever you are. Religion is another component of culture and certain ideas reflected in people's values and attitudes. Now, religion definitely does have an effect on business in some capacity, depending on where you are in the world. And it is dependent on the strength of that dominant religious tenant. And it also is highly dependent on, you know, the influence of that religion on people's values and attitudes within that culture. Now, religion does provide a basis for transcultural similarity, shared beliefs and attitudes globally. For example, you know, care for each other, um, love each other, do well, um, help the community, This, these sorts of components of religion. And it is important to note and include that, you know, non-religious or secularist societies are also powerful forces affecting behaviors and actions. So religion definitely does have some sort of influence or impact in culture and international entrepreneurship. Moving from religion, we have political philosophy and political philosophy is everywhere. Each country has its own set of laws. Each country has its own set of rules. Even though some of our countries, such as United Kingdom, US, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, are, are all you know, founded on English common law, each of the laws still within those countries, as those countries you know, age, as they have new governments, as they form new laws, they each have different laws as it comes to economic trade. And the rules and regulations of a country significantly affect the global entrepreneur and different things that you need to think about when you are either starting a business globally or you're you know, taking a business globally or working with a business globally. You know, there are embargoes, trade sanctions, tariffs, export controls, and many other different business regulations that you have to think about, especially if you're dealing with certain commodities such as food. Some countries will treat rice very different than other countries. What are some of the health parameters around that? What are some of the safety parameters around that? And so each and every country does have a political philosophy. They do have different rules and laws that they govern by, and this will have an impact on your business. This leads us to economics and economic philosophy. Just as each and every country has its own set of laws and rules, each set of country, those laws and rules impact how their economy works, how their economy runs, their economic philosophy. And economic philosophy is really the country's overall view of trade and trade restrictions. Now, each country is going to have different components to it. They're going to have different behaviors, different actions and reactions. And part of this includes, you know, their attitude toward balance of payments and balance of trade, convertible and non-convertible currency overall trading policies and rules. It's important to note that 
you know, countries will protect specific industries within that country. Countries will protect certain companies, certain types of companies, again, industries, right? In the US and, and Canada that recently there was, you know, trade wars between steel, lumber, even agricultural things like cattle. And to protect your own industry, you're going to do this through import duties, tariffs, subsidization of exports and restrictions on imports. Education often plays an important role in culture. And education doesn't necessarily mean formal culture, as in right now you're taking this class in higher education, you're taking this master's course. But it also means informal education, such as you know what we call street smarts, what you learn by just experiencing day-to-day -day actions and interactions within society. So education, we have formal and informal. It's also about understanding the literacy rate skills and career paths of cultures. How advanced are certain economies? How held back are economies? Does your product or service align with the local education? Something else to remember, so not only are you going to be trying to sell into these markets prospectively, do you have the educational tactics? Do you have the educational skill sets within those countries to manufacture your products? An example I had was back in Prince Edward Island, we had a tool and die company, manufacturing company that was looking for employees and they just couldn't find anybody. I mean, the first issue was they posted the advertisement in a newspaper looking for a 20 to 30 year old. And I can't remember the last time I've seen a 20 to 30 year old reading the newspaper, but moreover, there, there was simply a lacking educational basis of people trained in tool and die to satisfy those job needs of the manufacturing company. So what they ended up doing is actually posting the job position internationally. And by doing so, it gained a lot of interest. They had a lot of applications and then it, it moves to, instead of hiring somebody domestically, now we're hiring international employees. And then of course, there are certain legal implications that we need to address and consider when we're doing that. But it shows how education, education attainment, education competency is very important in the markets we are trying to operate in. Because if we do not have those things, then we might need to look at you know, taking this business to another market. Last but not least, will customers in global markets understand your product or service? It seems quite simple, but manners and customs are an important part of culture. And it's about understanding names and the customs that they represent. It's an important part of negotiations and gift giving and that brings us to another point, whether or not certain customs, whether certain countries allow for gift giving. So how you behave in one country is not necessarily the same as behaving in a different country, especially if it is, you know, different languages, different customs. These are the things that we need to prepare ourselves. These are the things that we need to educate ourselves on when it comes to manners and customs in different areas of the world. Now, this brings us to Hofstede's six cultural dimensions, and I know that they talk about this in the textbook, and I know they outline the different components of Hofstede's six cultural dimensions. I believe it might even be seven now, but there are a few issues with this study, and again, the, the topics that they discuss are power distance, uh, uncertainty, avoidance, individualism versus collectivism, masculinity versus femininity, long-term orientation, restraint, and indulgence. But I want to bring this to your attention because unfortunately people are still talking about this and, and using it as scripture in, in pedagogy, in, in educational information, but it is outdated, it is biased, and there are certain issues with it. Now, that being said, the cultural dimensions do get us talking. They do get us talking about culture and they do get us looking at different components of culture, which is important. We may not agree with some of the titles that, that they used in this cultural dimension, but it gets the conversation rolling, which is bringing people together, which is bringing greater clarity and understanding to the discussion of culture. Even though I said we need to move beyond Hofstede's dimensions 
um, I am going to explain how they came to these these topics or these themes and you know just a little bit about them so power distance really comes down to the extent of which less powerful members in an organization or institution such as a business family or team so a group of individuals right accept and expect that power is distributed unequally unequally so as we're looking at this again first instance i think of hierarchical structures right grandparents parents children grandchildren when i was growing up i very much and i still do respect my parents grandparents my elders i grew up in a hierarchical structure and so i was very much willing to accept and expect that the power of distance or the power of decision making is distributed unequally now individuals and societies that have a high degree of power distance accept hierarchies i grew up in canada so in canada similar to a lot of my friends also accepted hierarchies so everyone has a place or ranking without the need for justification lower power distance for example seek to have an equal distribution of power now the implication of this is that cultures that endorse and expect relations that are more consultative or democratic or egalitarian again when we're looking at management or business structures and we're looking at forming companies or, or the formation of companies this would be a flat organization and quite often people will use google as an example that flat organizations that are making collective decisions where equal distribution of power is given everybody has a say everybody has an equal say now hypothetically this should be the same in a democratic society but again we're talking about power distance we're talking about the the constructs of groups and how they act interact and behave and so the acceptance of hierarchies is in high degree of power distance whereas the equal distribution of power is in lower power distance groups. Well, the second theme is collectivism versus individualism and an individualistic society stress achievement and individual rights, focusing on the needs of oneself and one's immediate family. This often is reflected as me or I, I am going to accomplish this. Communication is much more direct, whereas in a collective society or collectivist culture, they put more emphasis on relationships and loyalty than people from individualistic cultures. It is about being in a group. It is about team well-being. It's about operating as a we. Now, in North America, often we find this individualistic attitude, whereas in some of the Scandinavian countries in Europe, we have very much a collectivist attitude. I win versus we win. Now, uncertainty avoidance is very important when it comes to entrepreneurship and entrepreneurs and leaders. And uncertainty avoidance is a society's tolerance for uncertainty and ambiguity. Ambiguity is another word for simply chaos, things that are happening that we just don't know what's really going on. It's uncertainty, right? It's also the extent to which members of a society attempt to cope with their anxiety by minimizing uncertainty, how threatening change is to a culture. Now, a high uncertainty avoidance index equals a low tolerance of uncertainty, ambiguity, and risk-taking, which results in strict rules, regulations, and so forth. So those with a low uncertainty avoidance, such as the United States, again, Scotland, areas where we have high, high levels of entrepreneurship, which is kind of a good indicator of uncertainty avoidance, those who have low uncertainty avoidance, again, such as the US, Scotland, those with areas of high entrepreneurship, they have a high tolerance for uncertainty. So they're okay with uncertainty. Those who have started a business, again, they will begin to learn if they're not already, if they're not at the beginning, they'll learn to cope, they'll learn to adapt 
to those levels of risk and uncertainty. And a big part of this and a big part of this course is to prepare you to minimize and, and again, give you the tools to recognize risk and find options, strategic options on how to mitigate or avoid that risk or change that risk. So again, high uncertainty avoidance index is, you know, they, they don't want to make mistakes. They're afraid of, uh, of risk. They're afraid of change. They're afraid of risk taking. Whereas a low uncertainty avoidant index is very much, you know, that entrepreneurial spirit that they'll take on anything. They understand the risk, they're okay with the risk, and they do the task anyway. This is where we begin to challenge a little bit about the themes that Hofstede came up with, uh, especially considering femininity versus masculinity, and we know that gender itself is not binary. And I'm not going to sit here and, and pretend to talk to you about the the qualities and the understanding the depth of conversation around femininity versus masculinity but there are psychology scholars out there such as jordan peterson who who do a quite comprehensive discussion on the delineation of these two topics but as it relates to hofstede's dimension they say that you know masculinity represents assertiveness, courage, strength, and competition, whereas femininity often values cooperation, nurturing, and quality of life. It's important to note that as business owners, it's important that we exhibit both. It's not just one way or the other. Remember, when you're dealing with people, not everyone is the same. Everybody is different. Everybody has a different background, different experience, different culture even. And that's kind of what we're talking about now. So it's important that you as an entrepreneur, as a leader can exhibit both of these qualities in order to connect with people and move the business conversation forward. This brings us to short-term versus long-term orientation. And this is the degree to which cultures encourage delaying gratification or the material, social, and emotional needs of its members. So long-term orientations show focus on the future in a way that delays short-term success in favor of success in the long-term. So if we're gonna break this down into its most simple thought, Long-term orientations means you are looking to do things for the long term. You're looking to delay instant gratification now because you see the long-term benefits. You're playing, as they say, the long game. Now, short-term orientations focus on the near future. It involves delivering short-term success or gratification and places a stronger emphasis on the present than the future. This is very much YOLO. You only live once. We're going to do it now and we're going to do it great. So short-term orientation is we are focusing on the current, the present, living my best life, living my best business as a, as a global entrepreneur. So I'm going to make decisions that impact the now. Now, short-term orientations are related to past and present and can result in unrestrained spending, often in response to social or ecological pressures. So again, if you are engaging in short-term orientation, if you are engaging in short-term actions and reactions, you might end up spending significantly more. Whereas long-term orientations, you're very much looking into the future and you're planning for that future and you're making decisions that are going to make sure, again, in a survivability context or a sustainability context, to prolong what you could have now in order for long-term success. Last but not least is restraint versus indulgence. And this is the extent and tendency for a society to fulfill its desires, measuring impulse and desire control. So high levels, again, high levels of indulgence indicate that a society allows relatively free gratification and high levels of bon de vivre. And so what this really means is they, there's a lot of freedom, there's a lot of flexibility, and there's a lot of ability for people to, to function and, and, and behave how they want within these high levels of indulgence versus restraint, which indicates that a society tends to suppress the gratification of needs and regulate them through social norms. 
So an example of this is in a highly indulgent society, people may tend to spend more money on luxuries and enjoy more freedom when it comes to leisure time activities. However, in a restrained society, people are more likely to save money and focus on the practical needs. So again, indulgence means you're here, YOLO, you're, you know, treat yourself. You're going to spend, 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 and you're going to have a lot of freedom and flexibility. Again, you might go bankrupt doing that, but it gives you the the ability and the capacity to spend how you want. Whereas restraint is is being much more conservative, is is holding back, is is you know purchasing what you need versus what you want. And again, this is a big central theme when it comes to entrepreneurship with me. When you are starting businesses, when you're looking at taking businesses globally, you very much want to start with what you need versus what you want. Because if you get what you want, you might be overspending, you might be overpaying, you might be purchasing things that you just don't need at the end of the day. Versus if you're purchasing things that you need, you are going to use that day in and day out. So this is an important part, especially when it comes to the themes of cultural dimension, when it comes to culture you know, what you need versus what you want. And when we're looking at it from a global entrepreneurship perspective, if we're looking at going into another country, is that society, is that group, are they indulgent or do they restrain themselves? Do they buy luxury goods or do they just get what they need? So if I'm here selling diamonds, I very much want to try and identify indulgent societies, people that are willing to spend the money on that product. Whereas taking a Ferrari and trying to sell it in a restrained society might not be the wisest decision overall. Now here is a list of issues with Hofstede's dimensions of culture. And again, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna beat this up. Um, I've already mentioned that you know it is biased. There are issues, and mainly because. The study was conducted in the 60s and 70s, and, and we can see how how quickly the world has has changed, even with you know the global pandemic. And the study itself was conducted with overwhelmingly highly educated individuals that were mostly male and white collar. So again, that is just a very specific market segment. So it's difficult to extrapolate off of that for other genders, other ages, other educational levels, other parts of society, it's it's difficult to infer culture when we're only looking at one, well, what appears to be, you know, a mono sample. But what it does, what Hofstede's dimension does, what it does is it gets the conversation rolling. It gets us starting to talk about it. So this is just a starting point and you can see some great you know, great studies coming out now that are looking at gender discrepancies. We're looking at pay discrepancies. We're looking at different cultural discrepancies. And this is all adding to the, the dimensions of culture and how we act and interact as a global society. Because each and every day that passes, especially with increasing technology, we become more and more connected. So it's important to have these conversations. It's important to learn from these conversations. And it's important to move these conversations forward. So when we're looking at the globe and leadership, when we're looking at global entrepreneurship, when we're looking at countries, when we're looking at, you know, how does all of this information we just discussed apply to the world, we can see that in table 3.2 from your textbook, the five cultural dimensions are broken down by country. Now we have along the top, you have the country, the power distance, all the way through to indulgence versus restraint, and they've categorized where each country falls. And so again, if we're just looking at this scale and a total of 90 countries, uh, I mean, there's significantly more countries in the world, but even if we're just using the scale of 90 and I take, you know, I pick apart Canada, here we go, power distance index of 39. Okay, so we're more on the stronger side of power index, which I already alluded to in, in my childhood growing up. Now, individualism versus collectivism, very individualistic, right? Masculinity versus femininity, I think we're going to skip over that, but it's interesting to see that 52 right in the middle, which kind of coincides with Canada. You know, we, we just sit on the fence, you know, this side, that side, we we're, we're, we're just want people to get along, right? We can look at uncertainty, avoid X pre, uh, 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 index, 
pragmatic versus normative, indulgence versus restraint. But what this table begins to illustrate, begins to categorize, is how countries overall. Now, remember, individuals within those countries may be different. In fact, statistically speaking, some of them are going to be different. It's just human nature. But overall, as a whole, they've gone ahead and categorized by each country to the cultural dimensions. And again, this table is in your textbook, table 3.2. Again, here is the table to look at more countries, and we can see that we've, we've sampled at least 100 countries with Malaysia coming in at 100 there on the power distance index. And again, just, just you know, as the next slide comes up, which, which is again the, the further continuation of this table, is just giving us a general understanding of where different countries fit on this scale. And it gives us some background information to look at and explore as a, as a global entrepreneur, which perspective countries do we want to do further research on to see whether or not we could expand into those markets. This is a breakdown again of this cultural dimensions and where these countries fall within the table. Here is the last part of table 3.2 and countries that do fall into and as you can see the countries are all categorized alphabetically but this is the last part to that table 3.2 cultural dimensions so this brings us to the globe and leadership assertive cultures enjoy competition such as the u.s and austria less assertive countries such as sweden and new zealand prefer harmony loyalty and solidarity Global entrepreneurs need to understand the differences and uniqueness of markets to gain a competitive advantage. A big part of this research that we're doing now, a big part of the information that we're trying to learn is to be able to do secondary data collection on the different countries that we're prospectively looking to enter. And so this is very important when it comes to global expansion. This is very important when we're looking at, you know, growing our business because the information is out there. It's simply up to us to collect that information, digest that information and make informed decisions. So that's session three, cultures and global entrepreneurship. Thank you for tagging along today. I hope it was useful to you. I hope that you really start to digest and understand that, you know, culture is a very important part to expanding a company globally whether we're looking at different customers that we might want to access or whether or not the employees that we want to hire. Culture plays a very important part when it comes to global entrepreneurship. If you like this video, make sure that you hit like and subscribe and ring that bell if you're looking for more content related to international entrepreneurship. Thank you very much. Have fun. It's been great hanging out.